Right, you can take your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter number 39. Genesis chapter number 39, me and Corley kid about our youngest, Lana, uh, the one that just sang. A lot of times her personality is totally different than me and her mother's. We're both real quiet and, and uh, just in a, in a crowd, we just uh, kind of blend in. She will stick out and always making new friends. I remember one time I was driving down the road and uh, I was just singing to her. And when I finished singing, she said, you're going to Hollywood. Uh, so, uh, anyways, I got one fan. It's good to be back in the U.S. and uh, uh, I, I'm, got me a got me a full size truck. If you saw what I drove in South Africa at one time, I had a Nissan Micra. You have to Google that. It's worse than a uh, one of the new Volkswagen Beetles or one of those new models. It's it's a, probably the girliest car that you can ever imagine. And uh, I had a girl come over on a missus trip from J. And she said that I lost my man card. And so I've, I've got my man card back now. I got a full-size F-150 driving around in that, so I'm glad to have that uh, driving around in that. And uh, so we're glad to be back. My boys are getting uh, used to this place. Uh, they are, they, Clark tends to be more South African than he is uh, American, but they were talking the other day when we had those bad storms. And uh, uh, they, they said, man, they, they started thinking, man, this place is dangerous. You know, I just thought that was funny. You know, people think of South Africa like that's where the lions and the cobras and all those dangerous animals and, and things are. And here these boys come back over here and they're like, wow, this place is crazy. You got tornadoes coming down on your houses and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, it's good to be back. Genesis chapter number 39. I would leave you with a, or want to want to give you a prayer request also to add to those uh, requests that uh, we're going to be praying for, or have prayed for is a little girl in our church back in South Africa. Her name is Ati, and uh, her mother, her grandmother rather, who she lives with, uh, passed away, I believe, today. And so her and her sister, she's in her early teens, mid-teens, I think she is, and uh, her, her grandmother passed away. So I know she's a sweet little girl. She's been faithful uh, to church, and uh, it's just been a, a joy having her. And I know that she's hurting during this time and probably uncertain as to the future. So... But I know that the, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. They're effective. And so let's pray for this little girl. Ati, if you can write her name down. A-T-H-I. Pray for that little girl. Genesis chapter number 39. And we're going to read this passage just because uh, it tells the whole story. So I want us to read there. If you have your Bible, uh, look there with me in Genesis chapter number 39. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to, him, spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her, or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in the Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he had heard that I lift up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me 
and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lift up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. This evening I want to preach a message to you, to you entitled, Take the Road Less Traveled. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day, the opportunity to preach Your Word. I thank You for my uh, church here, Lord. Uh, I thank You for my pastor and the people here, Lord. Thank You for the opportunity to preach. I pray for all those listening. God, that You'd help us to be attentive, to set aside all distractions. God, is in the home, there can be so many things that get our attention. But God, we'd lay those things aside for these few mon- moments to, to give undivided attention to Your Word. And I pray, God, not my words, but Your Word would penetrate our hearts, would convict us, would encourage us, would strengthen us, build us up, Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anyone that doesn't know Christ as their, as their Savior, that has been born again, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. ask that You'd be glorified through this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the road less traveled. This phrase, the road less traveled, means a choice made in one's life that is unconventional. It's non-conforming. It's a choice that leads one in a different direction that most people take. It's, a, it's an expression, a paraphrase from a line in a, night, a poem that was written in 1920 by Robert Frost. Uh, the title is The Road Not Taken. It, a line in that poem says, Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. The idea is that, is that man looks back on momentous decisions that he has made that brought him to His standing today. Though in truth, those decisions were not momentous or acts of courage at the time those decisions were actually made. Joseph was a man that took the road less traveled. There was no one to applaud him. There was no one to like his status. There was no one to write an article in the paper about him during those dark and difficult times in his life. But thank God the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to include this story in the Bible for what Romans chapter 15 verse 4, for our comfort and hope for us to learn from. The road I'm referring to this morning, this road of less travel that I'm referring to is the road of making the momentous decision to trust and fear God in the midst of trials and temptations and troubles that happen in our life as we see take place in Joseph's life. This is the road less traveled. This is the road that God would have you and I to take. And this evening, we will see in Joseph's life an unimaginable trial take place. A relentless temptation and unfair trouble come into his life. But yet, time and time again, Joseph chooses to take the road less traveled. The road of believing and fearing and obeying God in the midst of these terrible things. Let's look a little closer. Number one, we see the unimaginable trial in Joseph's life. Look again with me there in verse number one. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Can you imagine what Joseph is feeling at this point? Can you imagine, can you can you think possibly that Joseph was crying and shedding tears as he was being brought down to Egypt as a slave? How drastically his life had changed, being taken from his family and his people, from his father who loved him so much that gave him that distinguished coat of many colors. When Genesis chapter 42, verse 21, we don't have to guess about how Joseph felt during that time. The Bible actually tells us. 
tells us when his brothers came down and all the trouble that was befalling them, they realized that they were reaping what they had sowed and how they had treated their brother. And the Bible says this, they said to one another, this is Joseph's brothers, we are very guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish, the agony, the suffering of his soul, the Bible says. When he besought us, that means he, he was begging them and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Can you imagine Joseph crying and begging his brothers not to do this to them? An unimaginable trial taking place in Joseph's life. He had done nothing to deserve this. He was an upright man. He was a man that honored his father and his mother. He went from being loved by his father, father to be, being almost killed by his brothers and then ended up being sold as a slave and then sold again as a slave to the chief executioner in Egypt. He's in a strange land, surrounded by strange people who speak a strange language. He is nothing more than a piece of property now. He was separated from everything and everyone that he knew and loved. Can you imagine this trial in Joseph's life? An unimaginable circumstance, unimaginable trial that he's going through. Joseph had lost all freedom in the eyes of man. But I want you to understand that freedom on the earth in this temporal world, is not found in living where you want and doing what you want and having what you want. That's the devil's lie from the very beginning. But as Joseph would find, real freedom is found in believing and trusting and fearing God and obeying God and living for Him where He puts you. And no matter where that is, no matter the circumstances that you find yourself in, that is where real freedom is found. That's why Paul, the Apostle Paul, could write in the New Testament, and this is a wonderful thing as a missionary. When you go across the world, you preach in places where they don't have uh, the prosperity that America has. And when they get saved, not every, everything doesn't just uh, fall into place and, and they can go get a better job and make more money and buy a better car and better house. It doesn't work that way in many places in the world. And so Paul, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, talking to literal slaves, literal slaves, he says this, servants, slaves, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, meaning not just when they're looking, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's the beauty of the Gospel. It brings dignity and eternal reward to the worst of jobs and even the worst of circumstances. And, and Joseph understood this. He knew that no matter where he ended up, that God was with him and God was watching him and God was going to continue to bless him. Joseph had a choice in his heart of either getting discouraged and depressed and doubting God. And How many of us have done that? How many of us have done those very things when difficult times, not even probably not even close to being compared to what has happened to Joseph's, in Joseph's life, but we get down, we get discouraged, we get depressed, we begin to doubt the goodness of God, or he could continue to believe in the promises and dreams that God had given to him despite, despite his current situation of slavery. Joseph chose the latter. What will it be for you this evening? Can I offer you something tonight? Why not start looking at your current circumstances differently? This is going to require you to be honest and transparent with yourself and before God about some things. First thing I'd ask you is, are you truly right with God? Or are you hiding or harboring or playing around with sin in your heart and your life? Friend, that needs to be confessed to God. Stop playing games with Him. Secondly, start looking at your circumstance, that unimaginable trial, that you may be facing at this very moment, that's not, not something just to, just to get through, just to, just to uh, cl kind of close your eyes and, and, and get to the other side of. I've, I think I've told the story here of when I was a kid, my mom, with her warped sense of humor, she would take me to amusement parks and put me on roller coasters, and I hated them, but I would fall for it somehow. I would end up back on a roller coaster. I don't know how many times that was. It seems a lot now as I'm older, but it was probably just a few times. But I remember enjoying the click, 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 click going up, and then from there on out, 
I held my breath and closed my eyes until the, the roller coaster was over with. And many times in life during these tough times, these, these trials that come into our lives as Christians, when we should be looking for the hand of God, we should be expecting the hand of God to see Him work, expecting Him to work in our life, we have our eyes closed and we're just getting through it. We're trying to find some way even to get out of that situation that God has, has put us in to grow through. Go to God in prayer repeatedly till that trial is over with. Fill your mind with His promises and His truth all along the way. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to the lies that, that your, your, your heart, will, 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 heart and mind will feed you. But rather look to His Word. Look to the truth of God's Word. The multitude of counselors that, that God's Word provides us. The safety that is found in them. And expect God to work for your good and for His glory. And will you trust that God will execute or perform His salvation in your life no matter what happens in this crooked and perverse world? You know, in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says, being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, that work is the work of salvation. That was the moment that you got saved, that you were born again. But that's not the completion of your salvation. That's just the beginning of it. And every day after that, God is continuing to work in your life. Let me ask you this. Have you ever driven down the road and, and seen a house that was half built? It was new at one point. Someone started to build that house and maybe they ran out of funds. Maybe, maybe they got a divorce and, and the, the money was all... It, 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 they, they, they split ways and no way to finish, finish the house or whatever. They just got caught up or disinterested in that project. And there sits what was a new house and it's rotting now. So much potential, yet so much waste. Well, God doesn't do things that way. What God starts, He will finish. What God begins to, to perform, He will execute to the very end. And God, if He's saved you, if you know you're a child of God, though you may be in the darkest of times in your life, unimaginable trial in your life, God is with you through that. And the most important thing in that thing is that God would continue to conform you to the image of His Son, that He would get glory from your life. What difficult trial are you dealing with right now? Is it beyond you and your understanding and your ability? That's on purpose, to keep your dependency on Him. To keep your prayers coming to Him. And to bring all the glory to Him in the end of it. Joseph, you see, actually needed this pain and position to prepare him for his next ministry. God would use his place as slave and steward to prepare him to run Egypt and to care for the needs of the world in the end. God is making you into a minister. One preacher said this, it's war that makes generals. So it is trials that makes mature Christians. It perfects our faith. It perfects our, our walk with the Lord. It makes us more like Christ when we endure the trials that God puts us through with faith and fear in the God that is with us. The unimaginable trial. Then we see a relentless temptation in Joseph's life. Look at verse number 7. It says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. I want you to notice that phrase there, after these things. It came to pass after these things. I'd like to tell you that Joseph lived happily ever after. Corley and I have a, a picture in our room uh, and it, it, it has that phrase on it, lived happily ever after, I think is what it says. But that's not the case in reality. Though me and Corley, we do live happily ever after. Every day is a good day in our marriage. But in reality, there's problems. And as Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers, he had been bought as a slave by Potiphar, even after those terrible things taking place in Joseph's life, there was still some more bad that was going to take place in Joseph's life after these things. This is not a story, but reality. And Christians, you and I, will face trial after trial and temptations in this life. When this one is over, another test, another trial is coming. Rather than surviving it in the flesh, we should rather learn to overcome it and grow through it spiritually as God would have us to. The temptation was relentless. Look at what it says in verse number 10. Look at your Bible. It says this, And it came to pass 
as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. The temptation, this was a relentless temptation. Joseph had to work in that house, and day by day, Potiphar's wife was there to tempt Joseph. You and I know that temptations many times, most of the time, are not once off. And here we see the temptation of Joseph to have an adulterous relationship with this lady was every day at work. We face daily wars and temptations. This is why we have to be ready every day. The lure of sin is going to be there every day that you wake up in this body. You have to be ready every day to overcome it. I heard somebody telling me a story the other day of how this particular group of people in history had lost the the overall wars because they thought after they won specific battles that the war was over with. But the enemy kept coming back relentlessly to fight again and again and again, eventually conquering those people. And Christian, if you think just because you won today, and many times you, you got lucky today because you were not prepared, you were not, you were not ready for the battle, you just got by by the skin of your teeth, you better understand that tomorrow that same battle will be there to meet you face to face. It may not look the same, it may not dress the same, but there will be a temptation. There will be a temptation to meet you each and every day of your life. Peter warned Christians this way in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He said, be sober, be alert, be vigilant, be attentive, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It goes on, he says, whom resist steadfast, that means strong in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, Christians all over the world are facing the same temptations, the same adversary that you're facing. But you must be strong. Resist him steadfast, strong in the Lord. He was working hard, Joseph was. In verse number 4 it says he was serving. He was, he was serving well. Joseph wasn't sitting around idle. He wasn't being a bum on the job. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing each and every day. Everywhere Joseph went, he built trust. Everywhere Joseph went, he rose up amongst the ranks for his his, uh, integrity and his hard work. He was a good-looking guy, the Bible says in verse number 6. It says, He left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He knew not aught. He had saved the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly, a beautiful person, well favored. He was handsome, like his, he was a he was a he was just a good looking person, like Rachel, his mother. And I'm sure Potiphar, being a rich and powerful man, I'm sure his wife was not was not ugly either. I'm sure she was easy on the eyes also. And he could have easily felt like this was his reward. He could have easily felt like he was entitled, like he deserves this. I've heard stories. Of, of men and women that have cheated in their marriage and they excuse themselves by their hard work and their overworked life. They felt entitled to the sinful relationship that they got themselves into. I know a story a few years back, a pastor of one of the largest churches in the U.S., and he had a relationship with an underage girl. And I remember one of the excuses he gave was the, the, the hard work and the long hours and the overwork that he had put in. There's never an excuse for this kind of relationship. We've got to wake up every day prepared to face these sorts of temptations because the cost is way too high. You lose everything. He had an opportunity to do wrong secretly. She's a powerful woman with enticing words. They probably could have got away with this for a season. They probably could have covered it up for a period of time and gotten away with it. But but Joseph's theology or his belief in God kept him from sinning. He knew God was watching And all sin is ultimately not just against a a person or even a good boss, but is against the good God of heaven. Look at verse number 9. He said this, There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but these. Talking about his boss. Talking about her husband. Your husband's been good to me. He he trusts me. he's, he's he's, he's, He's given me a better job because thou art his wife. And it goes on, it says, How then can I do this great wickedness? and sin against God. Not against your husband, not against my boss, not against you, but how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph had a close relationship with God. Joseph had a right belief about God. 
He, he, he knew that God was watching. He knew that God's eyes were over him. He knew that God was seeing what he was doing. And he knew that sin is never just against a human being, but that all sin is against the judge of all the earth, the God of heaven. How could he do this great wickedness knowing this, that it was against God? Remember this, that temptation is not sin. Giving in to temptation is sin. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, but he sinned not. He was without sin. Satan came to him to tempt him. Desire for intimacy is not sin. Joseph probably had that desire. But giving in to that intimacy, giving in to that desire for intimacy in an adulterous relationship like this would have been sin. There's uh, the illustration of of fire, and that fire is a good thing. You can make You can cook out on it. You can make a fireplace. It creates a great atmosphere. But if you let that fire outside the fireplace off the grill and gets into the woods or onto the carpet, it causes devastation and destruction. And intimacy in marriage is a wonderful thing. Within the boundaries of marriage is a wonderful thing. But you take that intimacy and you take it outside the safe boundaries of marriage and you get... STDs and you get divorce and you get broken hearts and you get uh, that one flesh that God talks about being ripped apart, which we cannot see that one flesh being ripped apart. But anybody that knows uh, has been through a divorce or children that have been through a divorce know the pain that that causes in a relationship. Proverbs tells us about the person that falls for this sort of sin, that gives in to this sort of temptation. In Proverbs 7, verse 22, it says, He goeth after her, the strange woman, straightway as an ox. In other words, clueless. Goeth to the sla- as an ox goeth to the slaughter. He's clueless. He's not thinking. Or as a fool to the correction of the stops. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Friend, giving in to these kind of temptations will cost you more than you ever thought you would have to pay. Joseph withstood them relentlessly. Day by day, this woman was trying to get Joseph to go into an adulterous relationship with her. But Joseph was ready day by day, realizing that he was not living his life in darkness, in in secret, but that God, the God of heaven, could see him each and every day, and that if he sinned, he was sinning against the God of heaven. No doubt, Joseph had the desire for marriage and intimacy. But he knew this intimacy, this intimacy was going to lead him into adultery and out of bounds. God had a marriage for him later down the line. God would bless Joseph with a marriage and children. But this one was out of bounds. This is a sin not just because she's married to Potiphar and therefore wrong and wicked, but because she is not married to Joseph. It was going to be ripping apart that one flesh marriage. Friends, temptations will come to you throughout your life. The devil paints them as okay, or they're not that big of a deal. And if you listen to your your deceptive heart, it will also lead you to believe it's not that big of a deal. Who's really going to care? How much hurt and damage could this really cause? You deserve this, but it's not okay. Your godless friends will tell you it's not a big deal. Look at everybody else that's gone through the same thing. Really, you'll just be like a whole bunch of other people but it's not okay. They don't mind you breaking the rules. But God, the ultimate line judge, says they are off limits. And He sees what you're doing. He sees your life. He has something better for you. He's not forsaking you in the midst of your temptation. He's there with you. And He's got a way of escape for you if you'll look to Him and trust Him and walk with Him through it. Joseph, even in this relentless temptation, chooses to take the road less traveled asking himself in the face of of the temptation, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The road less traveled is fearing God in the face of a relentless temptation. And then thirdly, we're finished, we see unfair trouble in his life. We see unfair trouble in his life. Look at verse number 14. Then, or it says in verse 14, that she called, then she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, He hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud loud voice. Can you believe this? How much bad can happen to one man? Can you? Joseph doesn't even have time to process all the bad things that have 
have happened to him up to this point. He's still broken hearted probably over being ripped away from his father and still trying to process what his brothers actually did to him. And then he, he was actually doing pretty good in Potiphar's house and built up uh, credibility and, and, and was, uh, was being raised, raised up there to, to manage Potiphar's house. And then, and then this. He, he, he doesn't sleep with the lady. He resists the temptation. And now she slanders him. She lies about him. Lie, it's just not, it just seems like this is just not fair. And I don't know where you are in your life, but many times you can start to feel this way. This is not fair. And I don't know if you've ever been told this or not, but I've been told it many times, and I've heard it been said, life is not fair. Already almost killed by his brother, sold as a slave twice. Now, listen, he loses everything again. He loses everything. Everything. He didn't have much, but everything that he had and had built back up and Maybe, maybe they're starting to look like there's a little bit of light and I can make a life of this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. He loses it all again. He's falsely accused. I don't know if you've ever had that experience or not. You're falsely accused of something. That's not a pleasant experience. You, feel, you can almost feel defenseless. And it's, it's almost like the more you defend yourself, the more guilty you are. So you might as well just keep quiet. Let God handle it. He's... Here is this teenage boy. Maybe he's 18, 19 years of age. And he's accused of a terrible crime. He is slandered. His name is ruined by the cries of this woman. He's done nothing wrong. He's been excellent in his character. He does not deserve this. He is now a rapist in, to those around him. He's the Hebrew rapist. He's imprisoned. He goes, as one preacher noted, from the pit to the penthouse to the prison house. What a life. At 17, sold as a slave, now in prison for something that he did not do. And he's not like your normal prisoner that says, you walk into the jail these days and all of them are innocent. But Joseph really was. He had done nothing to get himself there. This is unfair. How could God allow this? You read your Bible and you will not find a better man in the Bible than Joseph. I mean, you read what he went through, what he what he endured, and you're like, man, this guy is incredible. It's almost like he was an angel in human flesh. This guy is, is, is incredible. And yet all this evil, all this bad stuff happens to Joseph. And here it just seems like unfair trouble coming into Joseph's life. But we don't see Joseph squirming. We don't see Joseph screaming in his unfair troubles. But we see, we seem to get a sense of, of an unexplainable peace in his life. Joseph believes God is with him, working in his life. And I believe he believes that God will win in the end. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, Be careful. It means worry or be anxious. Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, Christian, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, we got all kinds of solutions to our hearts and minds and the, the unsteadiness and the anxiousness and the stress that we, we feel on a day, daily basis. But let me ask you this. Are you taking those cares? Are you taking those requests? Are you taking those things that worry you to the Lord repeatedly? The Bible says that He, he cares for us. And, and, and that he, he wants us to take our request to Him. You know, you trying to carry those troubles around are like a, a, a small truck trying to carry a dump load, a dump truck load of, 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 of a burden around with you. It's going to break you sooner or later. But Jesus is one that actually can do something about it, and He asks you to take those requests to Him because He cares for you, and He can do something about it. And when we do that, look what happens. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, which, which doesn't, doesn't add up to, and it doesn't make sense when you look at the circumstances that you're going through, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're not to be worrying. We're not to be stressed out. We're not to be anxious and fearful. We're to be prayerful and full of thanks and taking those requests, taking those, those needs before the Lord and letting His heart, his, his peace fill our hearts and keep our hearts and minds stayed on Him and steady. 
Paul tells us in Philippians 2, to live without murmuring and complaining, leading blameless lives, shining, shining as lights in this, in this world. He tells us to live as is becoming or fit with the gospel. And, and he tells those Philippian believers that they had been given the privilege of not only salvation, but also of suffering for Christ. Before we go on, I want you to remember this. That trials don't make you sin, they simply reveal what is already in you. I saw the illustration one time of a person carrying a cup of water and someone bumping into them. The bump did not put the water in the cup that they were carrying. But the bump that they experienced simply caused what was in them to come out of the cup. And so as we go through trials, we go through problems, and we have troubles come into our life, and anger and bitterness and hatred and stress comes out of us, it's not the trial that put that there. Those, those trials and those, those troubles are simply revealing what was already in our hearts. And we're not to be that way. We're to have... We're to have the right things in our hearts. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, we see Joseph as a literal example of what we saw Paul write about, in that he was fearing God, and that everything that he did, he did heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. In fact, this prison where, where, where Joseph ends up is right where God wanted him to meet the chief butler who would eventually introduce him to Pharaoh where Joseph's long-held dream would be fulfilled. Let me say this. One person said, you may not like God's directions, but you will love His final destination. But if you want to experience His final destination, you've got to learn to trust Him with the directions. One old preacher said this. He said, Joseph lived on top of his circumstances. He had someone tell him that his problem was that his circumstances were on top of him and he needed to learn to live on top of his circumstances. Joseph lived on top of his circumstances. He did not get overwhelmed or have to live under them. He learned to live on top of them because he believed that God was still in control. Joseph realized something that we all need to grasp, and that is this, found in Psalm 47, verse 7 and 8. It says, For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye His praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of His holiness. This evening, you need to figure out who you're going to trust. Are you going to trust uh, your decision making? Are you going to make your decisions based upon your feelings, based upon your circumstances, or based upon what people around you are okaying or, or saying is not okay? Are you going to trust and obey the King of all the earth despite your circumstances, despite your feelings, and despite what people might be saying? Are you going to live under your circumstances or are you going to live over your circumstances by faith? God still reigns. He is over, He is working over and above and beyond what evil men may be doing and conspiring in this world and will ensure His good will comes to pass in your life. As I close, I want to ask you, are you going to take the road less traveled? The road of believing and trusting and fearing and obeying God? Or will you travel down the same old trampled pot, pot, pothole filled road, road of bitterness and fulfilling your lusts and lack of faith in God like many others around you are doing. If Joseph could go through what he went through, still believing God, still fearing God, still obeying God, what is our excuse? Take the road less traveled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time this evening. God, I pray that You'd please help us to take the road less traveled. Give us the grace to meet life's trials temptations and troubles with confident faith and fear of You. May our response to unfairness and the temptations and the trials be a clear testimony of our faith in You. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What a good message. Amen. We all needed that, I guarantee. We're going to sing a couple of verses of a song to give you time to respond. I believe that every message from the Word of God is worthy of your response. It's worthy of your attention, but it's worthy of your response. And I believe with all my heart, the greatest part of the service is the invitation where you apply, incline and apply the message. Now, all of us are going through trials, but all of us go through different trials. 
in different temptations. And you know, we need to take the high road as Joseph did. And we need to take this message to heart and ask God to give us grace and strength in the time of need. And the greatest time of need is when you realize that you're being tempted and that there's a trial that could really discourage you. And so let's pray and ask God to use this message in just a moment. But I want every head bowed and every eye closed wherever you're at, unless you're driving down the road. And I want you to bow your head and I want you to say, Lord, help me to take this message to heart and take the high road, take the road less traveled. And that's the road of victory. That's the road of peace. That's the road of knowing God's got a purpose to make you more like Jesus in all that you go through. So let's pray. Father, use this message and use this couple of verses that we sing as a time of meditation, but also a time of reflection in our own lives. And God, we pray in Jesus' name that you'd use the message to, to encourage us to take the high road, to take, Lord, what you want and, and yield to your will and your spirit when we're tempted and when we're tried. So Lord, as Brother Randy sings this song, may we respond in our heart and pray and seek your face and Lord, turn everything, every trial, every temptation, and even the temptations to come and the trials to come over to you. Well, thank you in Jesus' name.